This episode is sponsored by Audible. When humanity first encountered the brain slugs of the Puppet Master Nebula, their war concerns over reports they were hostile and controlling, we sent an ambassador and his report back was that all is well, so we agreed to a summit for all our ward leaders hosted at the Wellness Beach Resort on the Brain Slug Homeworld. On their return, all of our dignitaries and leaders universally agreed, all is well, and that is a further gesture of friendship any human could take a free vacation to the Wellness Resort. So welcome to another Sci-Fi Sunday here on SFIA, where we take some time to look at a notion popular in science fiction and ask how realistic it is or how we could make it work, and probably one of the best known tropes in sci-fi is the doppelganger, the imposter pretending to be someone else, often through some ability to shapeshift or mentally confuse those around them. It's hard to think of a TV show or franchise that hasn't done this plot. The evil twin or imposter or even the stand-in are person clones of themselves to handle boring jobs. Indeed, this trope is so popular that even its subtrope, Alien Impostors, shows up in virtually every science fiction show and tons of non-sci-fi too. The alien shapeshifter or hidden brain parasite acting as an infiltrator is so common it has plenty of its own subtropes, like you are who you eat, for shapeshifters who consume their prey to mimic them, often also to steal their memories. And that's an important place to start. Because for any infiltrator to last very long, they need to be able to mimic more than appearance. There's a classic episode of the Tick animated series, The Tick vs. The Uncommon Cold, where the Tick is fooled into thinking an extra-dimensional alien clone of his sidekick Arthur is the real deal, even though all it can say is, I Arthur, because the Tick is not terribly clever. His smarter sidekick has no difficulty later differentiating the Tick from his own clone. There's a thousand little ways an imposter would reveal themselves to the close companions of the original even if they were a perfect mimic of appearance. Eating or scanning the brain of your target also has some symbolic power as a story element, you're not just mimicking your target, you're becoming them and stealing their very identity. This in some ways seems like the ultimate violation and an act of theft but also generates a potentially sympathetic villain in that they might know and understand the target so well that they truly become them. Indeed such a doppelganger might not even know they are one, possibly by design, possibly by simply preferring to think of themselves as a sympathetic human rather than a vile monster and coming to believe it. Today we'll be exploring a lot of the sub-varieties of doppelgangers and imposters, along with technological options for it such as deep fakes, but our principal focus is on what such an alien civilization or element might be like. Now, could an alien race evolve that were doppelgangers by nature? Yes, much as we explored in Parasitic Aliens, we have the examples of chameleons and other mimic creatures in nature, and even mind-controlling fungi and viruses. It's a very logical pathway to be able to sneak in and prey on other creatures, though often the purpose isn't to use them as direct food, but rather to replace their eggs with your own, like the cuckoo does, and this is called brood parasiticism. This results in an evolutionary arms race between the parasite bird and the host to improve hiding and rejection methods, and this could lead to very good mimics. The subtypes of this where the mimic eats its parents or siblings, or the mafia hypothesis where the brood parasite doesn't mimic its host, it just shows up regularly to check on its eggs and smashes up the nest if they aren't there, as appears to be the case for the brown-headed cowboard. Or the host might raise the offspring too, completely aware that the offspring are not their own but be unwilling or unable to say no, and this may be an emotional and voluntary thing. One could argue a cat or dog could prey on humans by leaving their young on our doorstep, since we will tend to care for them, that's how I've gotten most of my cats over the years. However, today we're focused on mimicry and it's worth noting that a species evolved on this line might not possess a natural ability to trick a human by shapeshifting, but rather just be predisposed to use this tactic and therefore went on to develop technology and techniques for doing so. After all, we are a predatory species but not really good at hiding, biologically, but we are smart and inventive, and just as we'd expect human agencies to become masters at impersonation and infiltration, an alien with no special skill at it might develop subgroups that were masters. 
This is always a key concept in our discussion of alien civilizations as, by default, we would assume that any race that's been on the galactic scene for a while likely outnumber us by millions to one, if not more, and have had a lot of time for divulgence among its own people. So where we might have a spy agency of tens of thousands who might employ a few hundred dedicated infiltrators, they might use a smaller portion of their civilization for that purpose but still have a dozen wards principally focused on intelligence, and hundreds of millions of master infiltrators, each of whom is probably more skilled and better equipped than anyone we currently have, and they could be considered their own civilization even if part of a greater one. So today I mostly want to ask what a civilization would be like that was a mimic by nature and the technological pathways to it otherwise. Note that I say technological pathways because there really won't be a biological one even a full any technological civilization for long. As we discussed in our episode on smart matter, you could make a being entirely of tiny cells or catoms able to be arranged into any shape, and it's possible to imagine a colony organism evolving to be such a creature. Indeed we even see this with the shapeshifter founders of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, who are not only composed of ultra tiny bits that can move around and reshape, but are themselves a partial hive mind, often dwelling in a vast sea of each other with no dividing boundary between individual consciousnesses. Problem is, outside of sci-fi, this isn't really something that could ever be done fast or without clearly detectable signatures. It is easy for folks to forget that while we are composed of trillions of cells, individual cells can be composed of trillions of atoms, and an atom is to a cell what a brick is to a city. Cells aren't visible to the naked eye, by and large, especially as most are tucked under skin cells, but they are close to it and it's not coincidental that the discovery of the cell happened very early in the history of microscopes. Just like something built out of Lego blocks, movable cells, even ones with color changing ability, might fool folks at a distance but not when zoomed in. In this example our Lego block is our catom, a name derived from Claytronics and the original notion of an atom, which means indivisible thing, or that which cannot be divided. Catoms are the smallest object inside such movable or programmable systems that represents a basic unit. Note that they do not need to be identical in form or purpose, you might have hundreds of different catom types in a system, just you have hundreds of different atoms and isotope types on the periodic table of elements, or with biological cells. They also need to have mechanisms for moving and holding themselves in place which add to the necessary cell size, as does them needing to be generalists since a lot more of the basic functions needed for life that are outside individual cells in a larger organism like a liver or lungs have to be offloaded onto those individual cells now, and the bonds holding catoms together are generally much weaker than those inside metals or other solid objects so a shapeshifter isn't forming some steel hauled shield off its arm to repel gunfire or such, nor do effectively liquid materials like this simply ignore being shot and simply seal over the hole. Every catom hit by that bullet is going to be damaged, same as the cells in your body are, nor would ones blown out the back of you by the blast be able to just easily ooze back in. That's an example of how science fiction concepts minus the practical consideration of the how-tos, can run away on us to produce something seemingly invincible or preeminent that, in reality, is actually going to have a ton of unavoidable weaknesses, each of which might be corrected or mitigated but at a cost of making the thing bulkier, slower, and overall less amazing. As an example of that from a more conceptual direction, fiction often shows us impostors of unbelievable skill and skill that honestly should imply such infiltrators were already in your organization or your civilization's actual leaders. If you are so good at impersonating people that you can even do their job while mimicking their behavior, and can and have done this many times, probably frequently for folks engaged in various military, economic, and political strategy roles, often experts, then why the heck aren't you in charge back in your own civilization? particularly considering impostors like you should have no problem slipping into those roles, given what they are trained to do. And if we are just talking about allocating people of high talent to jobs, why use them up on risky infiltration work when you can use them for strategic and policy roles instead, especially given that you really only need to infiltrate and mimic when there's some parity of resources or ability in the target, otherwise you can win by numerous other less risky means. 
which tends to imply the folks doing this are either engaged in anthropology, which is very plausible, or their civilization is just prone to trying this tactic even when objectively it's not optimal. Folks who are incredibly fast learners and very observant of behavior definitely are well represented among our ruling class, and acting is a learnable skill too, and not without its value to potential leaders, albeit a bit less admirable than being fast learning and observant of people, so you're wasting your potential leaders on risky assignments of infiltration. Or maybe you just use the ones you wouldn't trust as leaders, but then they might embed themselves as leaders in the place you sent them instead and not turn the keys over to you when it's time. There's always a fear infiltrators might turn traitors themselves, especially given that by default they are not very honest and trustworthy types. I ended up planning and writing this episode because both a novel I'd picked up, Kingmaker by Robert Rath, and an old cartoon I caught a rerun of the same day, the tick in this case, had impostor shapeshifters in them and some genuine effort was made in the novel to point out how important it was for an infiltrator not to just do their research on a target and the target's culture, but also to pick a target to impersonate who would have had some reason to act strangely to those they'd encounter. They'd been away for years having life-changing events like being off at a war, or they had gone into mourning over the loss of a close family member, or even got fired and moved. The downside of course is that such folks tend to also be less likely to be trusted and more likely to be watched. Not because they are necessarily suspicious, but because the guy you haven't seen in years just isn't in your real inner circle anymore, even if you would like them to be. We have all had friends and relatives or work colleagues we were super close to and then they or we went away and on their return, for the best of intentions, things can get a little awkward and the relationship never returns to the previous state. Such folks would be ideal to nab and impersonate because little changes and things which seem off or misremembered have an obvious reason, but those same reasons mean you tend to be hesitant to divulge secrets or share access with them. There's also no realistic way to get life details off of everyone of everything but that's not always seen as a big concern. It really is normal for our good friends to not remember something we thought important, or to remember it differently or get that puzzled look which says they remember no such thing, but they figure that either you're right or they don't care to make a big deal out of it. The reality is the trick for dealing with impostors, of asking something only the real person would know, is only going to come up if you have reason to expect an impostor, and otherwise a casual reference to some prior event the impostor doesn't know of is likely to be met by a casual shrug or the usual comments we all make when someone is recalling something and we're not sure we remember it but we don't want to upset them. And even if you press the memory, it's unlikely to follow that the conversation will end in anyone doubting who they are. Nonetheless, there are some things a person just isn't going to plausibly not know or forget, and missing a couple of those could trigger worry that there's deceit going on, especially if you have any reason to suspect doppelgangers might be in play. These aren't always obvious though, do you remember that time you burned your hand at the campfire we had, could be followed by a head nod, but then you could go, aha, you never burned your hand at a campfire with me, and they, being a skilled impostor, will give you a weird look like you will be in a loony and say, I've burned my hand on campfires before man, I don't really keep an inventory of when and who was there. And we also have to remember that social media and selfies give big inventories of memory on a lot of folks and that's likely to expand down the years, so it probably needs to be a genuine secret you wouldn't report, like, I think your spouse might have found out we had an affair. Now the typical sci-fi workaround on this is to assume they've been brain scanning or torturing someone for info, and the latter would not really work well. Torture will get folks to tell you things and so long as you have real info to catch them out on the occasional lie so that they're afraid to say untruths then it probably will be true things, but that's not really working for a quick fishing expedition and they are likely to wonder what purpose you'll use it for and guess it's going to be used to deceive people or organizations they care about. Odds are, if they are the sort of person you want to impersonate, they are considered trustworthy by those people or groups, and that tends to imply they'd be willing to risk some and suffer some to keep back stuff or lie about something you probably wouldn't know, like their duress code if they had one. They probably are making the logical deduction that you are going to suck them dry for information to use against those they care about and then dispose of them, 
so unless you can make a good case for how they should voluntarily cooperate, they are likely to try to spoke your wheel wherever they can. On the other hand, desperate people in pain are predisposed to be a bit gullible when it comes to offering them reasons to cooperate, especially if you've been depriving them of sleep and otherwise screwing with them. The memory is associative though, so trying to ask someone to think of major but private moments and recall them to you while you're putting the thumbscrews on them doesn't seem a recipe for success. A brain scan would presumably work better, and that is a technology you could probably rely on existing more in the future. Indeed, there's likely to be so much audio and video of folks in the future that a deep fake would impersonate them more plausibly than they themselves could. After all, our friends only know us by our outward behaviors, things they've observed and seen, and in a civilization where more is recorded and posted, there is more to replicate of that public persona. Of course that could trip folks up too, I don't know how many hours of recorded episodes and interviews I've done down the years, but it's gotta be around a thousand by now, especially when you throw in multi-hour interviews. A quick deep fake of me just compiled from my episodes might be more convincing to my audience than one including my live streams and interviews, but neither would likely convince my close friends. I put on no false facade when I write these episodes, or do those interviews, I'm no actor playing a role, but I definitely have my game face on, so to speak, and it involves not using curse words or foul language. My friends are a little more used to me having a salty tongue as one might expect from an old army sergeant which I suspect most of my viewers don't really envision when thinking of me, but I try to watch my tongue even in my personal journals which are hundreds of hours of recorded audio too, generally don't have much casual swearing, and I try to watch my topics and tangents a bit, even in those, and thus might fool even my closer friends but also might be less believable to those who only know me through the show, either way I suspect I'd be easy to deep fake just for the sheer value of visual and audio material available. And an imposter or shapeshifter doesn't necessarily have to take your physical place either. In an increasingly virtual world, just being able to simulate someone's audio and video while the person themselves is away probably works too. They go on vacation and you abduct them and the vacation gets extended for a while, but all is well because they keep sending back messages and audio and video that fit. And 50 years from now, folks might be pretty unreal in most of the activities anyway, doing a lot of social events and even work in virtual spaces where their actual appearance might not be real to begin with. These are just additional factors for the potential imposter, benefits or challenges, but we need to remember that only in the case where those being infiltrated have no real reason to suspect it or how it is done can we really have a casual shapeshifter succeeding for long or at all. And eating someone's whole memories, while plausible as a technology, also means you're either just making a near-perfect copy or something mentally superior to the original. If we've got an actor so good they can literally absorb minds, which is definitely plausible as a technological and post-human path, then we get that same problem earlier of using a precious resource to impersonate when it could be doing better things some superintelligence able to copy minds on its own, repeatedly, while maintaining its original goals and needs implies a society so superior they shouldn't need to bother with infiltration. And if the minds needing to be mimicked are superhumans themselves, the mimics must be even smarter. Life is not a comic book, Tony Stark doesn't get to keep his Iron Man suit to himself, and Captain America's Super Soldier Serum doesn't get lost after one use and never rediscovered or improved on. A society doesn't have one Iron Man or Captain America, it has millions, and a society composed of superintelligent entities able to read minds and store them to impersonate people is one where everyone has the ability to read huge skill sets of geniuses and experts. No civilization composed of lesser or singular minds is going to pose any threat or benefit to them where infiltration would seem to make sense. Alternatively, if we're just making an evil copy, so to speak, of the original, one that just has orders to do something for the infiltrators, or to activate on command, then why not just brainwash the target to do the job? That's probably way easier. Now that might leave marks, metaphorical or otherwise, But even if that involved putting a chip in someone's head, folks need to be aware to look for it, and in a society where everyone has chips it might be less obvious, since such technology exists and would be valuable for other purposes, sinister and worthy. 
The Benny Talaxu of Frank Herbert's Dune also gives us an example of the problems with mind absorbing. They have a quasi-human clade called face dancers who can shift appearance through methods not really detailed well in the book, but basically muscle control. That really shouldn't work, but it is a decent enough hand wave and one also used by Dan Abnett in his excellent novel Ravnor Returned, except there the character doing the disguise is also a telepath and telekinetic, and the process is a very rough job and the person it was done on describes the process of recovery afterward as quite agonizing, like pulling your jaw only over your whole face. The face dancers though are just very observant and excellent actors, but a few thousand years later in the series, they've developed an ability to absorb minds too, multiple of them, and Hobart discusses the possible downsides of both. For mimics, the necessity of them having a deep understanding of the person they are mimicking may have the unwanted effect of the mimic then developing some, or a lot of, sympathy for both the target and the person they are mimicking. The organization that ordered the infiltration to take place always has to consider that this can happen in some cases, and so there is always a concern that your impersonator might suffer an emotional collapse or turn traitor on you. That's a real worry with things like sleeper agents, and that concern often dampens the desire to use them. You plant some operative in a group or society with the intent of having them spy for years, or even just wait patiently for a trigger moment and they end up becoming unreliable or even turning on you. You have asked them to do something terribly hard, risky, and unethical, so long term impersonation to walk a mimic ever deeper into a group over the course of many years, or to await that one special moment, is a real gamble. That's presumably even worse if they're getting a copy of that person's mind planted into their head, and it will be very easy for a real flesh and blood person to come to convince themselves they were the genuine article and the other prior memories are some weird dream or madness. Alternatively, as Herbert explores in his last Dune novel, Chapter House Dune, there is the impression that these more advanced face dancers, in absorbing countless memories during their various infiltrations, have become superhuman. Indeed they appear to be the nominal semi-secret antagonists of the last novel as we encounter a duo of strange entities who seem to take an ambivalent role toward the protagonists of that book and seem to be the puppeteers of events unfolding. For major Dune fans, yes I am aware those two, Marty and Daniel, are often seen to be the analogs for Herbert and his wife, and that in the expanded Dune written after their deaths they are revealed to be the evil ancient robot overlords from the Butlerian Jihad. Anyway, it would seem like you could anticipate such things and put safeguards in place, but it really depends on your technology. If your society is completely digital, in the brain augmentation and uploading way, these sorts of mind copy and replace tricks won't work, as folks would likely have various authentication measures built in. If you're more organic or analog, so to speak, then you are in a position to have a lot more unintended or unavoidable consequences. There are also a lot of ways to catch impostors in the act that folks tend to overlook, if you're expecting such problems. One example would be taking a book out of the page of spotting adulterated gold coins, the density was off for the volume, easy to spot for coins but harder for people, or a weirdly shaped object like a crown, but they can be submerged and their value measured. This is the trick Archimedes is said to have shouted Eureka about when he discovered it. Shapeshifters might be able to ground problems like this by taking an extra mass of water or air to cover their shift in volume and mass, but an x-ray is going to spot any atypical lungs or bladder analogs meant to rapidly do this, and if you're shifting that ability to individual tiny cells, well as I said earlier, every extra function you want a catom to perform adds to its mass and complexity and slows the overall function, and again, while we can also suppose that a vastly superior technology exists that can make them practically impossible to detect, this runs into the usual wall of why the alien Vader is making such an effort to do covert things when they have such an enormous technological advantage. And there are some legitimate reasons you would, anthropology comes to mind. However, while sneaking into a tribe or culture to experience and record it firsthand, or even give it nudges, seems reasonably ethical. Actually replacing someone really does not. Morality might not matter to alien anthropologists, but it always strikes me as unlikely you would study a primitive culture simply to understand it while also having ethics that allowed for abduction, mental extraction, and presumably murder. 
At best I could imagine picking someone who was near death anyway and suffering something like a bad fever, you sneak in and replace them and blame differences of personality or new quirks on the fever and life and death experience. This is still pretty unethical at many levels. Or maybe you cure the target and have them live among you, or upload their mind into a virtual paradise while copying the mind for necessary details, though I don't know how good a paradise it would be if you still need to study their culture in person for details, but maybe you keep the uploaded brain on ice till you can provide that paradise simulacrum. Regardless, if you can find a morally comfortable reason and method for doing this, then anthropology would be one plausible case for alien impostors. This one is also plausible then for getting details on a culture before you invade, though it runs into the big problem of why you are invading rather than exterminating an alien civilization, but being willing to do one doesn't imply an automatic willingness to do the other. Sending in agents to agitate or prepare for an invasion makes sense, and we do see this as a regular tactic of the Alpha Legion during their Great Crusade in Warhammer 40k, where they are often coming across lost human colonies that are less technologically advanced than the Crusader elements, and presumably it's less important to member a specific individual for general agitation, but getting people into the local government or military as spies or agents certainly helps. Though I've always thought it a bit strange that an 8 foot tall, super muscular, genetically engineered space marine would be prone to this style of infiltration tactic, but they do tend to use regular human agents in this role a lot too. The 40k setting has a fair number of infiltrator groups, and one of those is a cult of assassins called the Calidus, who are shapeshifters due to a very powerful, painful, and addictive drug called polymorphine. During a very painful process of several minutes, you can make outward physical changes if you have the control and willpower for it, and the Calidus also have extensive augmentation and surgery to allow things like height changes. I could imagine either flat out cybernetic bones that could alter in length and thickness, or some organic bones able to include small bladders and ligaments to alter size and shape a bit. This is a far cry from altering shape into anything at all, like Odo from Deep Space Nine and his race could do, but impersonating other humanoids is a little more plausible. They also have telepaths in both those settings, so scanning brains to mimic the original makes it easier to mimic than not doing so would. So too, we can't imagine entirely technological paths, like an outer membrane made of a material able to mimic colors and textures over an inflatable and changeable body and skeleton, or simply a body covering suit. That would work at a distance I'm sure, or for casual inspection. We hit that problem that whatever cloaking technology you've got, it's probably only going to work a handful of times before the opposition finds out it exists and gets a look at the tech in which case they can probably build near foolproof detectors far cheaper than you can build impostors. Of course, you could scare the heck out of their civilization by them knowing you have this, as they try to find out who the impostors are, and Star Trek Deep Space Nine has some brilliant episodes in its middle seasons, showing how a clever changeling can cause chaos inside their enemy without even needing to impersonate anyone, just with the fear of it. Of course the downside to this is that they will know you exist and be working to figure out your tricks for disguising yourself, better they not know how you do it or that you even can. Now the last imposter role we'll consider for today isn't a shapeshifter at all, but rather a body snatcher. This is probably best known from Robert Heinlein's classic novel The Puppet Masters, where we get the alien slugs who get into people's heads and take over but it's been borrowed from by many others and maybe best known in recent years from Stargate SG-1, where we get the Ghoul Old, a serpent-like creature that gets into people and takes over their mind. We explored that more in our Parasitic Aliens episode, but I wanted to mention it to close out today in more of the technological approach. X-Ray is going to pick up any critter big enough to have its own brain hiding inside someone and such a creature would have a tricky evolutionary path, though possible, as we explored in that episode. The brain implant option is more likely, as we expect we could stuff a human mind into something smaller than a pea, maybe a lot smaller, if we're talking about a non-organic computer mind. As I mentioned earlier, in a society with lots of brain augments and chips, sneaking another in or hijacking it to store an invader's mind is probably a bit easier. In such a case, it might be a lot easier just to sneak in some brainwashing implants that store something smaller than a full mind like a second hidden personality that secretly watches and only comes out at night, mostly. 
Babylon 5 played with that with one of their main characters being an infiltrator throughout Season 1 and 2, no spoilers who it was today though. Of course in the movie, Aliens, we hear about the parasitic xenomorphs only coming out at night mostly, too, and they infiltrate a society in a less covert fashion in that film, and its original Alien. But we also see human impersonation by monstrous aliens in another great film from that time, John Carpenter's The Thing, which is also based on a great sci-fi classic, John Campbell's novella, Who Goes There. I love both of those, but they stretch to assume a more animalistic alien could copy a human, and I think it would take something a good deal smarter and with technological aids to pull that trick off, especially on short notice. So that's the good news, you probably don't have to worry about landing on some alien planet and getting nabbed, and having some alien impersonate you to others just 5 minutes later, as good a defense and intel method as that would be to leave on some remote outpost. So too, you probably don't need to worry about some alien slug arriving on Earth to invade your brain and take you over. So, if one arrives in the mail, from Amazon, at your house in the next few days, do not worry, it just wants to help exfoliate your scalp and massage your head in a gesture of goodwill. But they are shy creatures, so unpackage it in quiet and don't tell anyone else. All is well. So it's time again for our Audible Audiobook of the Month and we mention a number of good shows and books that dealt with the notion of alien impostors, including John Campbell's legendary classic The Thing or Who Goes There and the new novel Kingmaker by Robert Rath, but as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the source for so many elements of this trope we've discussed today is The Puppet Masters by Robert Heinlein, one of the greatest sci-fi writers of all time, who gave us so many classics like Starship Troopers, Stranger in a Strange Land, and Puppet Masters. Heinlein was one of the most influential authors of science fiction and all of his many dozens of amazing stories are available on Audible, as are so many of the other novels and short stories we mentioned today or in other episodes. In fact, Audible has thousands of audiobooks available and literally centuries worth of content for you to pick from, and more being added to every day faster than you could listen to all of it. But they don't just have audiobooks, they also have many excellent podcasts, such as Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur, where we have every single episode on YouTube, plus several audio-only exclusives I've made over the years. That's just some of the great content in the Audible Plus catalog, which also has sleep and meditation tracks available as well as guided fitness programs and Audible originals like Roadkill, the newest work by my friend Dennis E. Taylor, who many of you know from his awesome Bobbivore series, which are also available on Audible. The whole Audible catalog, full of free books and other content, comes as a bonus when you join Audible, in addition to your usual one free audiobook each month and big member discounts on additional ones, and as always, new members can try Audible for free for the first month. Just go to audible.com slash Isaac or text Isaac to 500 It's hard to believe sometimes how long we've been doing episodes, Sci-Fi Sundays and our monthly livestreams are still fairly new, just 4 years now, but we're in our 6th year of having Audiobooks of the Month now, and the same for having a weekly Thursday episode, every single week since March 2016. The show itself though actually dates back to the early fall of 2014 when I did a video called Megastructures in Space that we finally updated earlier this year with our 2 hour Megastructural Compendium episode. But next week is the 8th anniversary of our original episode, Megastructures in Space, and we'll commemorate that occasion by examining the barriers to becoming a Kardashev civilization. Then we'll continue September with a look at post-science civilizations, who have discovered everything there is to know or abandoned future research. And then onto the grabby aliens perspective of the Fermi Paradox, and what grabby aliens are and if we will become an example of them. We also have our monthly livestream Q&A Sunday, September 25th at 4pm Eastern, and then we'll head into October to look at the idea of colonizing planetary rings, like Saturn's, and if life might be able to evolve in such places. If you want alerts when those and other episodes come out, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell. And if you enjoyed today's episode and would like to help support future episodes, please visit our website IsaacArthur.net for ways to donate, or become a show patron over at Patreon. Those and other options like our awesome social media forums for discussing futuristic concepts can be found in the links in the description. 
Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week. Thank you.